come before you tonight. God, we thank you for everybody that is gathered here, Lord, and gathering online. Lord, uh, as we just look at all the different names that we call you, we call you by a thousand names and you deserve every single one. As we look at your name, Shepherd, tonight, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your provisions. Lord, we thank you that you protect us. We thank you that you lead us, Father. We thank you for being over us. God, I pray that you would be with us and in this message tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I titled the message tonight, The Everlasting Shepherd. Tonight we're going to be in Micah chapter 5. I want us to read it first in full. So we're going to read the whole chapter in full. And then I'm going to camp out on verses 1 through 5. Micah is, is somewhat of this continuation. Micah chapter 5 is a continuation from Micah chapter 4. Uh, and what I found was super interesting as I was studying, and this is the first time that I had ever heard of it before, but they say that Micah 5, 1 in the Hebrew Bible is actually part of Micah chapter four. It's actually the last verse of Micah, Micah chapter four. And I, I looked it up. We have a Hebrew Bible. I checked it out and uh, it is. And so that's crazy. So it's kind of just a continuation from uh, what Andrew was teaching last week. So Micah chapter one, we're, or chapter five, we're going one through 15. I'm in that NIV. Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they will live securely for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth and he will be our peace when the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortress. We will raise against them seven shepherds or eight commanders who will rule the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod with a drawn sword. He will deliver us from the Assyrians when they evade our land and march across our borders. The remnant of Jacob will be in the midst of many people like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, which do not wait for anyone or depend on man. The remnant of Jacob will be among the nations in the midst of many people, like a lion among the beast of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of the sheep, which mauls and mangles as it goes and no one can rescue. Your hand will be lifted up in triumph over your enemies and all your foes will be destroyed. In that day, declares the Lord, I will destroy your horses from among you and demolish your chariots. I will destroy the cities of your land and tear down all your strongholds. I will destroy your witchcraft and you will no longer cast spells. I will destroy your idols and your sacred stones from among you. You will no longer bow down to the works of your hand. I will upright, I will uproot from among you the Asherah poles and demolish your cities. I will take vengeance and anger and wrath on the nations that have not obeyed me. All right, back up to verse one. Marshal your troops. Uh, chapter five starts out by saying, marshal your troops for a siege is laid against us. Like I said earlier, this, this verse belongs, they think, with chapter four. But a siege, if you don't know, is basically this military blockade of a city. It, it's when an opposing military tries to block the city from receiving supplies like food and water, right? They're trying to starve you into submission. There's a fun fact, a little side note. The word siege comes from an old French word that meant seat or chair or stool. The Latin originally meant to sit. So in a military sense, it carried this notion of sitting down, right? Before the place. The army's just sitting, it's chilling, it's waiting for you to starve. It's trying to starve you out. As I was reading a little bit about sieges, uh, this historian said that the longest siege in history was the first siege of Suta, which historians say lasted 26 years. They starved them out for 26 years. You talk about sitting and waiting, right? Suta is a Spanish autonomous city on the north coast of Africa, and it was bordered by Morocco. And the Moroccans tried to starve this city out. They surrounded them. They blocked uh, them from getting supplies on land. But the thing is, 
uh, and probably why it took so long is Ceuta is uh, on the north coast of Africa. So on a map, if you look, it's up against the sea and it's kind of a C shape behind. So the Moroccans are behind them trying to starve them out, but they had all this open ocean, right? So the Spanish just kept sailing out and getting supplies and coming back. The Spanish were like, okay, okay, yeah, you've got us, right? And then they would just sail out and go out and come back and get more food. Uh, but eventually they got through. Eventually the, the Moroccans got through 26 years later. That's pretty crazy. So Micah says, marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. Now, Micah doesn't mention by name who this army is who's laying siege, right? But the majority of commentators suggest that Micah is speaking about the Babylonians here, and it fits with last week's chapter, right? Last week we, we read in Micah 4.10, that Micah prophesied to Jerusalem, you will go to Babylon. And so they assume that it really is attached to Babylon there. But he continued, there you will be rescued. The Lord will redeem you out of the hand of your enemies. Jerusalem's going to be captured. It's already been put out there. God's already let them, they're going to be captured. But God's not going to leave them there forever, right? Because in order for God to build a new Israel, the old Israel has to be purged from its sins. And that's gonna be done through captivity. But eventually the Lord will rescue and restore them. And so it seems that this future siege is gonna be carried out by the Babylonians. Micah says, you will go to Babylon. What's interesting, and, and Andrew kind of pointed it out last week, is that the, the Babylonians at this time weren't even major players that really it was the Assyrians. The, the Assyrians during this time were the ones to look out for and they were absolutely terrifying. If you've read about the Assyrians, it, it's insane. But according to World History Encyclopedia, this is what they said. The Assyrian war machine was the most efficient military force in the ancient world up until the fall of the empire in 612 BCE. The secret to its success was a professionally trained standing army, iron weapons, advanced engineering skills, effective tactics, and most importantly, a complete ruthlessness, which came to characterize the Assyrians to their neighbors and subjects and still attaches itself to the reputation of Assyria in modern day. A phrase often repeated by Assyrian kings in their inscriptions regarding military conquest is I destroyed, devastated, and burned with fire those cities, towns, and regions which resisted Assyrian rule. They were the ones to look out for. And yet Micah speaks out even further in prophecy to Babylon. Eventually, Babylonians will conquer them. Babylonians will come in and break down their defense. And then he goes on. Micah says, as they do, as Babylon breaks in basically, as they do, they will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. To strike somebody on the cheek, they say is one of the most humiliating things, especially back then. It was purposeful. It was meant to disrespect you. It was the ultimate way of humiliating somebody. We see Job use this phrase to describe his humiliation and everything that Job's gone through when everybody turns against him and they're saying all these insults against him. In Job 16, 10, he says, people open their mouths to jeer at me. They strike me on my cheek in scorn and unite together against me. Micah says, they're going to break in and they're going to strike this ruler on the cheek with a rod. Basically, they're going to humiliate him. Most commentators think that Micah was alluding to the way that the Babylonians humiliated King Zedekiah. They didn't necessarily strike him on the cheek with a rod, but they definitely humiliated him. We see in Jeremiah 52, 9 through 11, what they did. It says that the Babylonians captured Zedekiah and marched him off to the king of Babylon at Riblah and Hamath, who tried and sentenced him on the spot. The king of Babylon then killed Zedekiah's sons right before his eyes. The summary murder of his sons was the last thing Zedekiah saw, for then they blinded him. The king of Babylon followed that up by killing all the officials of Judah 
Securely handcuffed, Zedekiah was hauled off to Babylon. The king of Babylon threw him in prison where he stayed until he died. And so this prophecy of humiliation definitely fits with Zedekiah. But some have suggested a little more here. Maybe somebody else is peeking through the pages of history here. Maybe somebody even greater than Zedekiah. There's a ruler that's going to come 700 years later. In Mark 1465, it says, Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. In Mark 15, 16 through 18, it says, Then the soldiers led Jesus away into the hall called the Praetorium. And they called together the whole garrison and they clothed him with purple and twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him and bowing the knee, they worshiped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, put his clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Maybe Micah, as he's looking down the corridor of time, he might be seeing a dual prophecy, one that's fulfilled in a small sense by Zedekiah, but in a greater fulfillment through Christ himself. Because as we get to verse two, it becomes apparent, right? That Micah now has Christ in full view. In verse two, it says, but you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Micah mentions two facts about this ruler that absolutely lock it in to be Christ. Micah says that this ruler, number one, will come out of Bethlehem. And number two, that his origins are from ancient times. Times. We're going to get into that because it was a cool, cool study for me. We know from scripture that Matthew applies Micah's prophecy to Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. In Matthew 2, 1 through 6, it reads, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his, we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel." So this ruler, right, that will come out of Bethlehem, according to Matthew, according to the Jewish leaders at the time, right, is absolutely Jesus. But Micah says something else that could only apply to Jesus. And this is what I really like. He says that this ruler is from ancient times. It's literally translated days of immeasurable time. This ruler is from days of immeasurable time. To give you a better idea of what Micah is saying here, Strong's Concordance says that this phrase, days of immeasurable time, generally carries with it this idea of a vanishing point, meaning a, a time that's too far in the past to think about, or a time that's too far in the future, that as you think about it, it just vanishes. That's how far in the future it is, or that's how far in the past it is. Have you ever thought about eternity? Have you ever like sat and thought about eternity? I used to do that like all the time as a kid. Like, you know, especially if you're thinking about God and how he's been from eternity and stuff like that. You ever had one of those daydreams where you just let your mind wonder, right? You start to think about how far eternity goes into the future or how far it goes into the past. You, you just keep thinking, and it just vanishes, right? That's where this ruler comes from. As far back as you can think until it vanishes. That's where Jesus is from. It's so far back that it's often just translated everlasting. You want to know who, who Jesus is? He's from everlasting. Is Jesus God? Absolutely. He's from everlasting. But what's super interesting about that is the Bible speaks about God himself in the same way, pairing Jesus up to God in the same way. In Psalm 90, verse two, David says, before the mountains were born 
or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. David saying as far back as I can think to as far forward as I can think from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Isaiah 63, 16. Isaiah says, you are Lord, our father, our redeemer from everlasting is your name. It's absolutely awesome if you think about it. The descriptions of this future ruler mirror the descriptions of God himself. It's amazing that people can walk away from the Bible and be like, I don't know if Jesus is God. I don't think he's God. Oh, maybe he was, you know, mighty God, or maybe he was a creative being. It just parallels God way too much. It mirrors the descriptions of God himself. The Hebrew scholar, Dr. Arnold Frutenbaum, who's considered a leading expert in Messianic Judaic theology in speaking about this future ruler said this, as in regard to his human origin, he is to be born in Bethlehem. But regarding his divine origin, he is said to be from long ago, from the days of eternity. He says that the Hebrew word from long ago or for days of eternity are the strongest Hebrew words ever used for eternity past. When you're talking about this ruler, he's using the strongest words ever used for eternity past. What is true of God the Father is true of the one who was born in Bethlehem. What is true of the Father is true of this future ruler. Christ and the Father are both from everlasting to everlasting. All the titles that we give God the Father belong to Christ also. And this claim of Jesus being from everlasting, it seems to flow throughout all of scripture, right? Isaiah 9, 6, Isaiah says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Paul uses kind of some phraseology too. In Colossians 1.17, Paul says, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Jesus even spoke of himself as eternal. In Revelation, John says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sounding of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like that, and the shining sun in all of its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as th though dead. He then placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Jesus says, I am the first and the last. You cannot have two first and last. That's a title for God, right? As far back as the first and as far forward as the last. That's me. Jesus again calling himself eternal. In John 8, 58, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, right? Before Abraham existed, I am. In the same way that God identifies himself to Moses, Jesus identifies himself to us. I am that I am, everlasting to everlasting. There seems to be just this complete harmonious flow throughout all of scripture that Christ, like God, is from all eternity, that he is before all things, that he is the first and the last, that he too is I am, and that he is everlasting. In verse four, Micah goes on to say, he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. That word for shepherd here is ra'ah, and it can mean graze, feed, pasture, tend. Some translations say he will stand and feed his flock. But this word is also used multiple times to describe a position, a position of ruler, or shepherd. In many verses, it's described as somebody who takes care of the needs of others. And so it's often translated shepherd. And so I, I think the NIV here has it right. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. One of the roles of Christ 
in the millennial kingdom, right, is to shepherd his people. That's what he's going to do. To not only feed them, but to guide them and to protect them. They will be in complete dependence on him. It's a role that is very familiar to Jesus. In John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen and must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus will continue that role in the future kingdom as the everlasting shepherd. And because he is their shepherd, Micah says that they're going to live there securely. He'll be this everlasting shepherd who protects them. Micah then says his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. When Christ comes back and he sets up his rule and reign in the kingdom, he will rule the whole entire earth. He's not just stuck to one geographic. He's ruling the whole entire earth. His kingdom is going to be situated in Jerusalem, but his jurisdiction is going to be over the whole entire earth. No one will be able to escape his eye. Nothing will happen on earth that he won't know about. And because of that, his people will live securely. They'll live in peace. Lastly, in verse five, Israel says, he will be our peace when the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortress. Like I said earlier, the Assyrians were the dominant enemy in Micah's day. But Micah is speaking of a future time here, right? And so Micah uses the Assyrian name to describe Israel's enemies in general. Obviously, the, the Assyrians aren't going to be there in the future, right? But Mike is basically saying there's nothing to fear because he will be our peace. Jesus himself is our peace. Not he will bring peace, even though he does bring peace. He says he will be our peace. He is the cause of peace. Peace originates inside of him. One commentary said he is peace personified. He's what peace would look like if it was a person. In the future, there's no reason to fear anymore because Christ will be their peace. Israel has always struggled for peace. If you look at everything that they've ever gone through in the Bible, if you look at what they're going through now, Israel has been in constant attack their whole entire history, especially from the nations around her, right? And she'll continue to struggle until Christ returns as her everlasting shepherd who will give her peace with her enemies. But more important than a physical peace from her enemies, Christ will give them peace with God. The Bible says there's a time coming when all Israel will be saved. There's a time coming when they're all going to turn back to the Lord as a nation. That's not right now. And they don't live in peace now. But there is a time coming when they will turn back to the Lord and he'll usher in peace. Paul mentions this day in Romans 11, 25, he starts, I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. And so all Israel will be saved. As the scriptures say, the one who rescues will come from Jerusalem and he will turn Israel away from ungodliness. And this is my covenant with them that I will take away their sins. Let me ask you a question tonight. Is Christ your peace? Do you want Christ to be your peace? I know in a room like this, it's very easy to fake it's very easy to pretend that Christ is your peace. Christ is probably the peace of most of us in here, but I guarantee there's some of us tonight who Christ isn't our peace. We haven't made that step towards him yet. And I'm talking to you tonight, right? Christ is offering you peace. That shepherd, that everlasting shepherd is offering you peace between him and God, but it only comes through him. First Timothy 2, 5 through 6, Paul says, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all. If you want peace with God, it's only found in Jesus. In John 14, 
Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The only way to find everlasting peace is through the everlasting shepherd. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask the band to come on out. Should have done that a little bit earlier, but I'm going to pray really quick. Father, Lord, we just come before you again tonight. Lord, and I know whether it's in this room, Father, or just out there, God, there, there are people that have not made their peace with you. Lord, and I, I know that you, you offer that to them. And so, Father, I pray right now, Lord, that you would move any heart, Lord, that is stubborn or hard-hearted. Lord, that you would break that to pieces. Lord, that you would soften it. God, that you would draw them to yourself. Father, for those of us who are saved, Lord, for those of us who do know your peace, God, we thank you for it. We thank you for shepherding us. We thank you for taking care of us. We pray that you would just continue to watch over us, Lord, and that we would tell others about you. In Jesus' name, amen.